Before we really get started, let's just talk a little bit about what YouTube really is, right? So, um, anyone know what the, what the largest search engine in the world is? Google. Google. Anyone know what the second largest search engine in the world is? YouTube. YouTube. Right, so YouTube is becoming really, really popular. How many of you have used YouTube? How many have used Vimeo? Flickr? Smug mug. Hmm. Okay, so there are there are hundreds of, of video sharing sites out there. YouTube is obviously the biggest and the most important one. So here are a couple of facts about YouTube. There are more than a billion unique visitors every month. A hundred hours of video are uploaded every minute. And when Google bought YouTube for $1.6 billion in 2006, people thought they were crazy. While Google doesn't break out YouTube's earnings separately, they estimate that in 2013, YouTube's earnings from ads topped $5.6 billion. So let's, let's start talking about viral videos a little. Um, is there a certain number of views or shares or likes? Like how do you define what makes something viral? I would say the old number was like one million, but now in 2014, I would say it's like five to 10 million is what a viral video is, like that, that number. A while back, you would look and say a million, a million views, that's a lot of views, but now it's, it's, it's not that much. And if you do the calculations as far as like how much money you can make off of that, it's roughly anywhere from uh, a thousand to maybe five thousand dollars. So that does drive some incentive to kind of create a viral video because you can just monetize it and make money off of it. Which how many of you guys know that YouTube now? I mean, I think it's kind of fairly well known, but you guys can make money off of YouTube. You guys know that, right? Yeah. So I'll explain something real quickly. A CPM is pretty much uh, like per thousand views. So in the back in the old days, it used to be you. CPM was worth, uh, one CPM was like a dollar. So if you got a thousand views, you'd get a dollar. But now the average is anywhere from one dollar to six. And if you're partnered with uh, companies, um, sometimes they can get you higher CPMs. So if you have like a makeup channel, uh, brands can come there and they can say, all right, well, we want to just target these people. We'll give you like a $15 CPM. So I just want to explain that so you guys know what those, why people do this professionally and people just have like one man shows on YouTube. It's because they can make money off of it. Um, so yeah, back to your question, I would say like five to 10 would probably be like what viral is right now. Great, thank you. Um, so I have some free time this weekend and I'd like to just make a viral video. How do I do that? <laughs> ah. <laughs> you, uh, I, there's a million, I mean, there's a lot of ways you could do it. One is show someone falling down or hurting themselves. <laughs> um, something cute, something that's shareable, something that I think kids could share, and something that makes you kind of uh, warm inside. Or, well, I mean, it's, it's a bunch of different things. As long as you, you're making someone feel something, like Coney was a huge viral hit, and because it, it made you change the way you thought a little bit. Um, everyone saw that, and even though, I don't even think that, comp I don't know what they're doing now, but they made you kind of feel different and wanted to change and feel like by sharing that you're kind of changing and you're helping someone do something. Um, so yeah. How, how much, in, in your opinion, how much of something becoming viral is really kind of just luck of the draw? Oh yeah, I think a lot of it is luck of the draw. It's about who's sharing it and like, it, someone like if Ashton Kutcher shares something, that's like one thing where it's like, okay, this can go viral overnight. but. On the other hand, like it would take like a million other people to like individually, with say like less than like a hundred followers to all tweet it together. But like if someone like a big celebrity wants to blow something up, like Ellen or like Oprah, they can make something viral in minutes. So, in in your opinion, is it better for it to sort of gradually build up over time by a lot of people who have a hundred followers versus Ashton Kutcher causing it to go? insane. Uh, it depends. I mean, you look at someone like Hannah Hart who started a show called My Drunk Kitchen. Uh, she, she had that video up and she, she didn't know what was going to happen. And it was one of those things where it just rose really quickly and she was able to capitalize that and create a show off of it. I mean, she just had this random idea. I'm going to get drunk. I'm going to make a cooking show. 
it got millions of views and then she started doing it like consistently. Um, she's a great example of someone who took advantage of her like viral success where you look at someone like Antoine Dodson, the hide your kids, hide your wife guy. And he, he tried to capitalize with it, but what the difference between what he did and what Hannah did was Hannah stayed true to her, that first viral video. She continued on that trajectory of, of what she was doing originally, where Antoine completely changed what he was doing. He, ch he changed his hair, he changed his clothes, he started like rapping and doing things, and people didn't like that. So let that be a lesson if you guys have a viral video and you want to continue doing it. Stay with what people want you to do now. Yeah. Great, thank you. And in case you're wondering, it's probably too late to do Drunk Kitchen, so. <laughs> um, I, I want to uh, play uh, uh, the trailer from Please Subscribe. So can we roll the video? Usually I just say I'm a YouTuber. And people, people, oh, you like watching YouTube videos? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm like one of those guys that makes them. The way that we're now watching our news and our entertainment online it's the most important change that's ever happened to media in my lifetime. So you don't have to like shoot for six months. You don't have to hire a bunch of individuals. You just do what you want to do when you want to do it. People ask me like, when did things begin to change? And it all happened at once. It was all just like this giant boom. I'm just a guy from Ohio. I still don't know what it was, what I did. Uh, that made everybody stick around. Like you kind of become attached to, almost addicted to, the numbers. Get more views, get more people clicking your ads, you're gonna make more money. It's as simple as that. I think it's kind of a loner thing, but that's why I like it. Some people that don't like that, they need to be around people to thrive. Five years ago, I was sleeping on my floor and stealing my neighbor's Wi-Fi, going to soup kitchens and things like that. And I was about to sell my computer because I, I had no clue how I was gonna pay the next rent. It's kind of ironic. These people that have thousands and thousands of people who love them are some of the most lonely people. I think they still probably assume it's just like a fun hobby that I do and I'm actually a mechanic or something. YouTube is cool in the sense that I don't have to have anybody else have their hands in the creative process. It, it is so new and it always weird to think like I could do this for the rest of my life because no one's done it for the rest of their life. This community is an amazing community and the things that can happen, I can't even put it in words, it's just awesome. It changed my life. It becomes more about the game of YouTubing than you know, the art of making something really creative and cool. And, and this is a, a really great documentary, and, and it is available on iTunes. So I, I would encourage you to uh, go out there and, and check it out. Um, so we've been talking to, mostly to Dan right now, but let's shift over to, to the marketing guys a little bit because we want to talk about not just creating great videos, but then how do you actually get them promoted and, and get them out there to the most people that you possibly can. Um, so, so Brett or Jake, can you... Talk to us about what the long tail is and, and what that means. Go ahead. <laughs> Step in mm. words. Uh, well, I guess the long tail in YouTube, I would imagine it's just more the, the title of it. That's really what I would focus on in terms of long tail. Um, I, when I hear that, I think of from an SEO standpoint, how are you going to draw people in from what kind of keywords? When I think of long tail, I think of Google Suggest. Like when you start typing something and it starts having a bunch of different things like that. And in terms of YouTube, capitalizing on what people are already searching for and making videos upon that. There's uh, tools out there that actually let you find out what people are already typing in for long tail keywords. It's one called ubersuggest.org, which you can just start typing a letter. You just pick letter A on YouTube and it'll show you the top stuff that people are actually typing in. And I kind of come from a different way of, instead of trying to create a video that's maybe something to know, you don't know if they're gonna be searching for it, in terms of SEO and trying to get traffic, I go from the opposite way, and I let what the, you know, what's Google saying? What does Google say these people are typing in? And then take those exact same phrases, make those the title of a video for a long tail search. And in terms of video, we all know if you go to, uh, you just go to Google, 
there's, in terms of SEO, and I don't know if everyone's really familiar with it, but it's just kind of manipulating what shows up in the top 10 or two, first two pages or whatever. But video always shows up in the top couple because more people will click on a video and Google would rather promote YouTube than they'd rather promote somebody else's website because they'll get money if you go to YouTube. So a lot of times what I'll do for long tail is find the long tail keywords that are really good in say regular Google search and then instead of trying to compete against that, you create a video on those things like that. And then if you're able to promote it correctly using different channels out there, um, there's a high likelihood, high likelihood that you'll actually show up within that, um, those long tail search keywords. I don't know if that really answers it, but that's how I use long tail, and that's how I think of it when I hear the words. Well, and I would just add, um, when, I search, when I think of long tail, I think it's physically a longer search term, and with there being so many people on YouTube now, uh, there's so many niche topics that you can create a video for. Um, that, that's where you really get into the long tail. And uh, I think as you, as Brett was talking about, use the data that's freely available to you to see in advance what people are searching for, what they want more of, what's going to be popular. You can save yourself uh, some, some time in backtracking by planning that in advance as opposed to creating and then worrying about uh, the marketing. And I know that's probably the opposite uh, from, from Dan's thoughts. We look at it from a marketing perspective. Uh, he's looking at it from the creative process and the product itself. And one last thing to add, too, when, you know, I do a lot of YouTube and on my, or YouTube, and if that's a word, I guess. I, gotta use, I don't have cable, so I always only use YouTube. But I, I do a lot for my phone and add stuff to watch later, so I know, like, once I get in front of my computer or somewhere where I'm just hanging out, I can just sit there and watch whatever it is I already put my watch later. But I've noticed, and this is just me being you know, picky about it, but coming from an SEO standpoint, people will do not dumb things, but just uh, they don't know that they're doing it in the wrong way in terms of you got a mobile phone and you look down the screen and there's only like this much room to really make your, your title stand out. And if you put like your company name or you put something that's not keyword based, if I search for how to make some kind of tea or something like that, that tea name or whatever should be the first thing and then you should explain it, those other words, because otherwise I'm not gonna see what it is and then there's a high likelihood I'm not gonna add it to my watch later, which means that I'll never watch it, unless it somehow shows up again, but I don't know if that helps, but it makes sense to me. Great, thank you. All right, so let's go back to Dan for a minute. Um, in terms of the actual video production, I, I think there's a, probably a big difference between uh, film and television and videos on YouTube. So do you have any suggestions for how to create content that, that is excellent for YouTube? It's all over the map. Uh, let me ask you guys, how many of you guys watch like vloggers, people that like talk, okay, so a lot of you guys, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> You'll notice that the quality doesn't really have to be there. It's all about the content. And I, for a while, was, I, would, I would watch these vlogs, and I'm a fan of a lot, a lot of these people, clearly. I'm, I'm friends with them. Uh, and I'd watch them and be like, what is this guy doing? What's this angle you can't even see? But that doesn't really even matter anymore with YouTube. You don't really care about that like, so much when you're watching someone talk about their life or, or vlog or just share their experience with you. So. Does like the quality, or does the camera that you use? Do you have to be shooting with a, you know, a red to do a vlog or, or anything like that? No, you don't. You can shoot with a, a little small Canon Power Shot that's you know two hundred, three hundred dollars. But then again, you look at someone like Freddie W. who shoots, and his stuff is very on par with you know, I don't want to say TV. I mean, like they look like multi-million dollar films, and he's crushing it right now, and has been since day one. Um, so as far as like the quality, like, I mean, so, so the question was like the quality or what was the, am I on the, am I on the right thing or am I just going off on a thing? <laughs> yeah, you're going exactly where okay. I was hoping okay, you were going. Great. So, and it took me a while to realize this and for some of you guys who are creative and, and pixel peepers, that's, I don't know. I always look at them like, oh, look at the color correction, look at this, look at the framing, but sometimes it doesn't matter. For YouTube, a lot of it's acceptable if it's just about the content and the story. And uh, that took a while for me to kind of get over. So if you guys are shooting something and you have a sketch you're doing and you're, you know it's going to YouTube mm -hmm. and obviously you want your work to be flawless and you want it to be perfect, but if it's not, it, it's okay. So 
Um, again, you have the vlogs that are like small little cameras and you have like Freddie W content, which is just, it looks really well produced and he's shooting with the Reds and Alexas. But at the end of the day, I think it's just about the, the, the content and the story. So, yeah. What about consistency too though? I know that's like a big deal for a lot of different vloggers. Like if mm -hmm. you put out something every week and then like you don't do it for like three or four weeks or like what, what happened to him? Where'd he go? And then you're like, you're, I know you yeah. can kill your competition with yeah. just basically just putting out video, video, video. Some people put out one a day. Mm -hmm. Now, you wouldn't be able to make it awesome each day, but I guess it's just... Well, being consistent on YouTube is one of those things that if it, you guys were ever looking to be like full-time YouTubers, or some, whenever someone asks me, like, oh, what does it take to be a YouTuber? And consistently, a consistent, consistency is the top of the list. It doesn't matter if your videos are the best or you mess up in your videos or there's a jump cut here that shouldn't be there. It's about when you promise your audience when your content's going up, you better have it there at that time. Even if it's once a month, once a week, or once a day, if you miss a day, your audience kind of, I don't want to say turns on you, but they, they get kind of uh, upset if you kind of break that. Because like they, YouTube viewers and fans, they become almost like they're watching a TV show. And, you know, if that TV show is not on at 8 p.m. on Thursday nights, they, you know, you're going to get a little upset. So being consistent with your content is like, and it doesn't matter. Again, it could be once a month. It could be once a week, once a day. But it's just consistency is super important as far as what you promise your audience because that's like a one-on-one -on -one connection, I feel, between creator and fan. Um, you're expecting that from them. So you have to be consistent. Cool. Mm. Great. So I, I think from there, let's talk about um, how to create a, a channel on, on YouTube. What, what are the best practices around that, do you think? You guys want to take this? Or is, that, is that for me or? For any right of on. you. <laughs> go for it. I mean, I mean, I just make sure it's branded, making sure everything makes sense. If you go to your Twitter, if someone goes to your Twitter account and then they go to your YouTube and then they jump over to your Facebook page, if the colors and everything's not all the same, it just adds for confusion. Like making sure that's all set up before the get go is like one of those things that is necessary. I've, I've had uh, clients where, I don't, I don't know how they're doing it, but some of the, you probably know, and I'd probably love to find out, how, how they're able to add their navigation at the top of YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it's like you get to this certain level, and then when you have that, that's really cool because you can lead them to different parts on your mm -hmm. site. But in terms of setting up, I would say that and making sure you have something, I don't know if you agree with this, but something brandable in the corner in case that video does get shared in different locations. There's something maybe like the right-hand corner, just a little watermark thing that kind of says who's the creator. So it kind of goes back to that person. Those, for setting up a page, that's what I've always done. When you said branding, that's absolutely true. I mean, I know some people think it's just, oh, I'm just uploading a video on YouTube. But if you're gonna be, if that's like what you wanna do, you have to, yeah, you have to brand yourself because it's, even though it's just you, consider yourself a business. And even though it's just you and a camera, or you're selling yourself to these people, these people who are watching your content. Um, what you said was annotations at the end where you can push people around and that's important. That's important to get up before the video ends to show people that like this isn't just one video and you know to kind of put in the in the description other links to other things that people where they can find you like Twitter and Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, I was recently working with this uh, a client who wanted me to do some consulting with him about his YouTube channel. I told him all these things and he was like oh, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, yes, it does make sense because you want to make it like it's like this little rabbit hole where people can keep watching you and they're like, they don't just watch one video from you. They like you on Facebook. They follow you on Twitter. They go to your Instagram and follow you there. Um, so annotations and just the description, it's a job. And I know a lot of people are like, these people are just putting up the YouTube videos. And for the longest time, I thought the same thing. I thought this is an easy thing for people to do, but it's not. It's a full-time job. Shooting your videos, editing them, uploading them, tagging them, making sure that you're sharing them on all these social networking sites. Uh, the film that I created kind of goes over a lot of that stuff and how people like share it and how uh, there's a part where one of the characters, Wheezy Waiter, kind of goes on for like a tangent and it's just like a jump cuts of him talking about Tumblr, Facebook, Instagram, this and that. So it's really kind of a grind to do it. Um, so, yeah. Well, have you seen the, I mean, you might be talking about this with the annotations, but like mm -hmm. I've, uh, it makes you watch more videos like you're talking about going further and further on their own channel. But at the end of a video before it's over, I've seen it where they've 
and you guys, I'm talking to guys that know this way better than I do, but like, they'll like point to something and the, the video is right there and that's an annotation. If you click on it, it goes to that YouTube, that next video, like watch our next videos, this one or this one, and the guy's standing there and he points to both of them mm -hmm. and they can click on it like that. Is that what you're talking about with better annotations? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, you can annotate at any point in the video, but a lot of people have taken that one step further and at the end of the video, they'll be like, exactly, they'll be like, click here or click here and they'll mm -hmm. just put like a box around it and it really incentivizes users and I don't know what the percentage is, but I know it's super high that people will kind of click through and keep watching. You know, you go through that YouTube kind of just like, you're just like watching it and you just keep clicking and just there's links on the side and you just don't stop. Sometimes I find myself just looking at weird things like spider <laughs> videos. <laughs> and I mean, I'm sure everyone's done it, but if you can really just target them and say, hey, let's go here, I'll show you where to go. If they're like holding your hand, it's a lot easier for a viewer to click and watch more of their content. And also from like an SEO standpoint, if you want to look at it like that, it's all more views. So you're actually like piggybacking on top of something you did awesome with, and then you're kind of getting your other videos to be seen, and then it's kind of like that whole, like, uh, just steamrolls into something better once you have all the more views on each on each video and those kind of show up higher in the search for each of those. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so at that point, you're not even allowing the SEO. You're creating the SEO mm -hmm. yourself, being like you were watching this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, which cool. is cool that YouTube does that. Mm. Right. So so we we sort of touched on this a little bit, but can we go a little bit more deeply into kind of the idea of digital asset optimization? Exactly what should you do to your YouTube videos to make sure that that the search engines will find them or, or, or they'll be able to, to be found in other ways? I mean, I would definitely, all the standard things, make sure you have a description that's awesome, your tags are great, uh, your title is great, um, making sure that you actually have a, tran uh, it's transcribed and you actually look at it because Google will transcribe things and say things that aren't right. So <laughs> you gotta go through it and mark it and make sure it's all perfect. I think that actually helps when, because I don't know if Google can actually tell what's being said in the video, if that's something they can rank. They, they don't really rank images the same way. They can do it from pixels. Like if you drag an image into the search bar in Google Images, you'll see that same image showing up every, on other websites, which is a great way if you have your own content to like make sure no one's stealing your stuff. Just take your photos and throw them in there and see if it's on someone else's website. So I know they can see things like that, but I don't know if they're able to rank things from what you're actually saying in a video. But if you have a transcript, it's, it's, uh, they can read that and they can actually use that for ranking things. I mean, in terms of optimization, that's really what I would see. I'm sure he's got some other things to add that I haven't thought of. I don't know, like the metadata. Well, I would say don't over tag. I think YouTube added some kind of algorithm where if you over tag and you like tag something like Justin Bieber when you're not talking about <laughs> Justin Bieber, they, they kind of like shut that down. So like you cannot, your video won't be searched if someone searches for Justin Bieber. So. Uh, I think the best practices for tagging is tag your name, like tag everything that has to do with the video, but just don't over tag because the more tags you have, it kind of, the system kind of sees it and says, all right, we're not going to really, like if you condense it and only have like five words that you're tagging, even though you could tag like 10 more words, I think those five words hold more, more weight in SEO than they do if you're tagging like a million words. So don't over tag. I know it's like when you're tagging, you're like, oh, I talked about this, this, and this. But just take those like the, the things that you think people are actually going to be searching for and that are topical and just put those in your tags. Yeah, exactly what you're saying. They, they actually do have an algorithm for it. It's kind of, for websites, they call it bounce rate where someone, so for people that manipulate SEO and stuff like that, they'll get some website that doesn't belong in the top 10 and it, you know, people click on it and as soon as they see it, they're like, this isn't what I'm looking for. They jump back and they leave. That increases something called a bounce rate where Google will eventually, they, they can't look at everything, but what they do look for is they, they have analytics of their own. And they'll see, okay, all these sites here have really high bounce rates, although they're ranked number one or two or in the top five, whatever. Um, we'll then get the team in, I think they're in Michigan, to do the manual reviews. So they go and they do all the manual reviews and they look and go, well, that shouldn't be there. This guy's spamming. So they do the same with videos. And if you tag like all kinds of stuff and it, and it starts to show up for these different tags, they have the drop-off rate, which is kind of like you can see it in Google Insights now, I think, where you can actually, which is like the analytics for YouTube. And you can actually see drop-off rate. So if people are like watching your video and like 10 seconds in, they're like, mm -mm, this isn't for me. Then they'll see that and they'll stop ranking it and you know, it kind of goes against you and it kind of, I mean, especially if you're doing it for your brand and it's your thing and you're kind of like trying to manipulate, you're kind of, you know, uh, 
I don't know the right way to say it uh, without saying bad words, but like you're up the creek that's not a good one uh, mm-hmm. because you're the only person that can be that brand. And if you screw it up, you can't reinvent yourself, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Google's uh, theme from the beginning is don't be evil. So if you're doing things like that, it's kind that, of ironic now, but yeah. considered <laughs> evil. And uh, I would also add uh, if someone's looking for a technical video on when to pick strawberries. Uh, the length of the video is also something of importance. I, I am much more apt, and you'll see statistics that people are much more apt to watch a 30-second video than a five-minute video. And they'll look at the length of the video before they even click on it, and that's part of what determines whether they click on it or not. So match up the length of your video with what your topic is. Uh, I, just, I unsubscribe to somebody because he talked too much. Because he'll, he'll in, intro the video, he'll talk about something, and he'll talk about how you should try this product, and Blah, 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 blah. I'm just get to this part where you tell me the important stuff. And once that part came, I was like, I'm done listening to this guy. So I just unsubscribe. So you're right. That makes total sense. So if, if someone was thinking about, I, I want to actually make a living from YouTube, where would they start? How, how important is it from the beginning that they have a strategy for where they want to actually go? I mean, sometimes, like I said before, with Hannah Hart, it's completely just like luck of the draw. Someone picks it up, it goes onto Reddit, and it just goes viral, and then that's what happens. But if you're starting from scratch and you know nothing and no one, I would go to, I would, I would reach out and like, you know, and look at what people that you look up to are doing, and try to. I don't want to say mimic them, but kind of look at their practices, see when they when they release their videos, see what time they're actually releasing them. Um, being consistent, being creative, just doing something that, trying to do something that no one has done before. And I keep bringing her up, but what Hannah does, I think is, you know, it's very interesting. No one's really had a drunk cooking show before. And a lot of people are doing stuff like that where they're taking, they're taking, they're trying to do that and doing like, oh, I'm playing drunk video games or I'm doing drunk bowling or something like that. They're trying to take a spin off of that. Um, Anytime something goes viral, people try to do a spin off of things like Flappy Bird. If you go in the app store right now, every, thing in the top 10 is flappy something. Um, but just being real with your audience, not trying to just jump on something, even though so many people will jump on something that's viral or topical just for SEO. For example, I just brought up Flappy Bird, but so many people are talking, you know, will do talking or uh, parodies of Flappy Bird. That's cool, and that's one way to get noticed, to be like, all right, I'm going to jump on because everyone's searching for this thing, and if I can get on the top of, uh, you know, if someone goes into YouTube and types in a Flappy Bird, if I'm up there, that can kind of jumpstart my YouTube kind of career because people can see that and they can subscribe and stuff. Um, Call to actions at the end of videos are are kind of important, even though I can't really stand them, and that means, you know, at the end of a video or a sketch, someone will jump on the screen and be like, hey, I'm so-and-so, thanks for checking this out. If you like it, subscribe for more and blah, blah, blah. I usually turn off it by that point, but it's good to do. It's really good because it's like you, you're just telling all these people where to find more because you want to consider your audience uh, not smart. You want to make sure, you, wa- you really want to treat it as if people who are watching this are children and they don't know what to do. It's like this is their first time watching it. So if a, a, you know, a 40-year-old mother is watching YouTube and saying, oh, I thought that young man was charming. How do I see more? Well, if you tell her how to see more and say, subscribe and... It's very simple. I know it's like, it's, you know, the, the content creator feels like they're reiterating, reiterating themselves, but it's mm-hmm. smart for them to do. They're converting people who are non-users into subscribers, and then they're creating this fan base for other people to kind of find them simply. Um, again, creative and be real about what you're doing. Don't just jump on and, and do something because you think, oh, you know, you have dollar signs in your eyes because you know it, this... YouTube has money now and people are just making a lot of money. Can't stress that enough. Just be real. And if you force it, um, it's going to come off fake and people aren't going to like that. And if you're just starting off, it's good practice to kind of do a couple pretend ones and maybe just show your friends and not really, you know, don't upload it to YouTube. Maybe, or maybe upload it to YouTube, but keep it private and show a few friends and get their feedback and see what they have to say. Um, being open to your audience and engaging in your audience. A lot of these people, uh, you know, when I told my parents, they're like, oh, I'm doing this movie about YouTube, they're like, why would people care about people who are sharing their lives? And it's about sharing an experience, I feel. Um, in that engagement, 
of someone uploading a video and another person who's a world away commenting and saying, hey, I really relate to you, and that person seeing it and a conversation being started. That, for a 15-year-old girl, is very important when they're talking to Daily Grace and saying, oh my God, I have this communication, even though it's different from um, creator to fan, from fan to creator, the fans of the, of the content really feel that they're connected. They feel more of a connection to someone who's a YouTuber rather than someone who's like uh, a Michael Sarah or Brad Pitt. They can't like talk to them. But with YouTubes, <laughs> with, with the YouTubes, with YouTubers, they feel that they're a little bit more connected and that makes them kind of feel warm and fuzzy inside, if that makes sense. Yeah. And what do your family and friends think about YouTube now that you've created this whole documentary? They think it's cool. Yeah. Um, now they get it. And, uh, and a lot of people say that. And the, the one thing that I love hearing about when people that know nothing about it or go into watching the movie being like, you know, with like a bad taste in their mouth, being, oh, these YouTube, you know, YouTubers, whatever, they'd say, oh my God, these people are actually funny and they're real people. And like, I see that it's not as simple as I always thought it was. So when people are educated, and that's the point of the film is to educate people and show that this is a real thing and uh, this is a real career and these people really take their time, money and energy to make content for people. And it's a career that didn't exist um, seven, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I so, think another thing is just to make sure that kind of along the lines of what you're saying, to be passionate about what you're doing. And if you're not passionate about the content you're creating and, and find the content that you're creating interesting, how in the world can you expect millions of other people to find it interesting? So if you don't go into it with a passion for that particular content, that idea, then you can't expect others to be interested. Good point, because especially if you're going to have to keep creating more and more content about something that you, even you don't find interesting, it's... Now I'm the fried spaghetti guy, and I gotta be interested in fried spaghetti <laughs> to make another 100 videos in my series. <laughs> right. So, so beyond that, uh, from a marketing standpoint, if someone were just starting out, what kinds of things did you think that they should kind of have in place before they really start promoting their videos? Uh, that really matters what they're trying to achieve. Like, if they're just trying to keep people on YouTube, then basically what we said before with all the branding and everything and making sure everything's set up and you're good to go there. But if, on the other hand, you're doing it in the way I, like, when I do stuff on YouTube, I think of it to try to get them off YouTube or get them to do something, take an action, something like that, the, the call to action at the end, which... Yeah, you have to do it because otherwise people don't do it. You know, if someone doesn't tell you to go here, people won't do it. So making sure wherever they're going to go, whatever they're going to get, is set up and ready to rock and roll. So if you have somebody that, uh, I don't know, something, you're making a video on how to do something, and then, hey, if you want the rest, I got all this other stuff on my website you can have for free. You just got to go get this report. So if you don't have the rest of that sequence set up in terms of the email that comes out, and then the next one that comes out, that whole drip campaign and where you're trying to get this audience built up, then, I mean, sometimes it can work to kind of test ideas where you just kind of put it out there and see, is this gonna work? And once you start getting subscribers, then it's like, okay, I gotta go and do this now. But otherwise, it's better to have the whole funnel, is what we call them is in marketing terms, is it's a marketing funnel. So they're gonna go here, they're gonna see this. Once they get to here, they're gonna be in the list. Once they're in the list, this sequence is gonna go out. And if they don't do this, then that. Like, if this, then that sequence is that, well, if they were on this video and they just dropped off here, well, they're dropped off here, because once they're on your site and you're tracking them with something, there's different video players like JW players and stuff like that, where you can actually see their engagement. And if that user jumped off, send him this email, why'd you jump off? If, well, if you want this, whatever it is I'm trying to tell you to get, here's a discount code, something like that. Have that whole funnel mapped out and, why, and then make the videos, of course, but have the whole system that's the only way I, in terms of the marketing world, it only makes sense. If you go around marketing guys and you say you don't have that, they kind of do like one of these, you know, like this guy doesn't have that. You know, like, you know, it's kind of like not having analytics for your website or not, you know, it's just like, well, what? You don't have analytics, it's free, just get it. It's kind of, if you don't have your system set up, you're not really marketing it in terms of the internet marketing type ideas, but those sometimes have, bad views, people kind of say that they're, it's, it's marketing, but it works, man, it totally works, so I don't know if that answered the question, but. 
kind of. So what about social media to promote YouTube? I always try to use OPA, which is just a term me and my buddy uh, coined, which is other people's audiences, and just kind of, like I use things like uh, Hootsuite, which is kind of nerdy, but it's, um, it's basically just a way to manage multiple channels in social media, and I'm watching different things, like different hashtags that are on t certain topics. Maybe I'm trying to really get to know this guy like, uh, that has like a good audience of the people I'd like to you know, talk to. What, what's he doing? What are they, you know, how can I make something that stands out to this person? So if you have someone like Chris Brogan, which n maybe no one knows who he is, but in terms of marketing, he's like social media, you know, awesome guy. Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, he, these guys are shake, movers and shakers in the marketing world. So if you're able to have these relationships going and, you know, you, you do things for them, they scratch your back, you scratch theirs, when it's time for you to, you know, drop something that you want people to see, I try to leverage other people's audiences because in terms of some videos, that if you can get it in the right hands, like you were saying with Ashton Kusher, you know, like he probably wouldn't promote some of the videos that I would create, like on how to do stuff. But, you know, like, you know, but for the guys that are marketing, you know, you come up with a neat strategy, like I just figured out something just recently, how to advertise to specific people, I'm not gonna make a video about it. But if I was, I would drop it to these certain guys because I know that they would see the value in it for their audience and say, wow, this guy's found something really cool. I'm gonna share this to people. For, I'm gonna share this with people. So making sure you have those relationships set up before you actually do it is the most important part because the last thing you wanna do is, oh, I, re I friended you yesterday. Hey, can you promote this video for me today? You know, they don't, they're like, they get that all the time. They don't wanna talk to you, but I don't know if that, said, I don't know if that answered the question either, but you know. Well, I'd, I'd be interested to hear Dan's perspective from speaking with all the YouTubers about their use of Twitter versus Facebook versus the comment section and things like that and the mix that they use? <clears throat> Typically what I see is when, when someone comes out with a video, it kind of goes on all platforms and it's less kind of selly. It's more, it's not like, please click my video. It's more like, here's a video that I did today. Check it out. Or here's today's video. Boom. I don't see a lot of YouTubers really like if they're putting out a video, tweet it more than like twice because after that it becomes, it becomes kind of spammy. But if you see it on all these different platforms, it's not that spammy. It's like, okay, Facebook, Twitter, maybe people take a snapshot and put it to Instagram and say, oh, hey, go check it out on my channel. I just uploaded a new video. Um, I think because of YouTube, the more comments come from there and it's smarter to engage on YouTube it's, it's good to do it on Facebook and, and tweet back at people too, but I think majority of it is, uh, is keeping the conversation exactly where you want them. Yes, you want them to click off and go to your Facebook page and follow you on Twitter and stuff, but you want them there. You want them on YouTube because that's where they're making their money and they're getting their views and all that stuff. So if you can keep them there, I think it would probably be smarter for a YouTuber to, to keep the conversation on YouTube. But do you also say at the end of your video sometimes where hey, what do you think? Leave a comment below. You know, some, it's not, that's a call to action in a sense. Exactly, um, yeah. That, I mean, that's a really smart thing to do and a lot of people do that. And it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of trickery. It's kind of a way for people to kind of, because the more comments on your videos, the mm -hmm. higher it kind of goes. And, uh, you know, YouTube and Google Plus is now all about engagement and stuff. So people are going to ask you at the end of a video, even if they don't really care your opinion, they're going to say, what do you guys think about something, mm -hmm. fill in the blank. So they want that call to action. And a lot of people, when they see that and hear that, they're like, oh, this person really wants to know my opinion. And for some of them, they probably do, but a lot of them, they just want you to comment so they can just get the conversation going and you just, in that workflow of continually to talk back with them and comment and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How important is it then to actually engage in the comments and how do you deal with mm -hmm. the negative comments or some of the crazy ones that are in, in your documentary uh. where people say completely ridiculous things to you? It's super important to engage. If you're not engaging, then that's uh, half of that as a YouTuber, I think it's you engage and you, that's what's so fun about fans and the creators because it's like a conversation. And the, when the fans put a comment down, they really feel that the creator is going to read it and really take their time. And if the comment's good enough, that they'll respond with it. As far as the, the, the trolling now, I really feel that that's calmed down in the last few years. Maybe I'm wrong, but whenever I see a video, also I think YouTube is making it a lot easier for, to, vote uh, to vote down. And when you have this whole fandom saying, 
like, you know, instead of responding to the troll, they can just say thumb down and that comment will eventually just disappear. So that's pretty cool that they've done that. It really discourages people from leaving like trolly comments. Um, as far as how people deal with it, I feel that after a while, being a YouTuber, you just kind of say, who is this person? It's a 12 year old in their basement, not, you know, who cares? So that's pretty much what I think. I think a lot of people have thick skin and don't really let comments really cut too deep. You answered most, uh, a lot of them generally. I just wanted to go into more specifics, mostly with SEO, because SEO can get confusing about keeping track of like uh, everything that everyone's searching, what should actually hit. Particularly, I do tech videos, and that's changing every single day. Do you have a way of like keeping track and figuring out like what content you're actually going to hit specifically, especially if there's like two things that people are honestly talking about? Well, I'll let Brett comment too, but uh, a great thing to use is something like Google Trends so you can see what's trending before you even make the video so that you, you know where to direct your or steer your, your topic based on what people are actually searching. And that's the great thing about anything internet related is that all of the information is there and nearly all of it is freely available. You can see what your competition is doing, what they're doing that's working, what's not working. You can see what people are searching. You might have a great idea for something and then find out that no one searches for it and, and scrap the idea based on that. Or you might have a, a different direction that you go based on what the actual search data is telling you. I don't know if you had any. I mean, for electronics, one thing I would, this is just how I would do it, and this is how I do it for different industries, is if you haven't used the tool uh, ifttt.com, you can set up recipes. So for certain sites that have, uh, you follow, I don't know what the electronic sites you follow, like maybe consumer reviews or something, but that's probably not the right one. But, you know, <laughs> something like that. Find whatever. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, if you watched everything they said, it, it gets an, almost annoying going to Mashable and, you know, TechCrunch, but what I've done for some of the things I pay attention to is I set up recipes that if this article from TechCrunch or Mashable gets this many tweets plus this many views and something else, I want an alert to my email, meaning that this, for some reason, this thing's standing out. What is it? So I don't, I don't want all their stuff because then I don't have enough time. You know, no one has enough time to go through all the stuff that you want to see, but you know if all of a sudden especially during like CES time, if there's something they put out that got this many views, this many retweets, uh, there's probably a reason that thing's starting to like tip the viral scale, like there's something they just made is gonna be awesome. So whatever that is, I wanna know before everyone else knows. And I do know before everyone else, besides the people that just shared it on Facebook and Twitter, but, <laughs> but you know before like the majority of people, cause you have those, those sneezers, those people that like just kinda sit there on tech crunch all the time and kinda put out whatever, you know, as soon as something comes out, they like it. They, no matter what it is, even if they didn't read it. But you know, those type of people, you want to leverage what they're doing, and so that's, that's what I would do. If this and that, and besides that, there is a site, um, it's part of Blogspot, which you know, is Google's blogging thing, but it's, I think it's youtubetrends.blogspot.com, and you can actually categorize different things um, in different YouTube category, categories, find out what is showing up the most. And from using that, you can find, find out you know, someone might have just hit on something that they didn't really, a lot of people aren't marketers. So they, they, don't, they just put something out and make, start make, making sense and it might be a cool review, but being that you have like the, the skill set to make it better, you can actually do it and then knock them out, you know. Thank you. We have a question from this side. Yeah, um, I, I am William De La Cruz, film student at Full Sail. And I have a question about YouTube. Um, because I've always wanted to do YouTube as a job. Like, I honestly, my dream job is to be a famous guy in YouTube uh, like you guys. And uh, how can I start, like, right now so that um, I can slowly work my way up and to the point where the AdSense from YouTube will be the one that will be able to uh, sustain me in life so I don't need, like, another job or something? Okay. I'm not famous on YouTube, by the way. I do have a YouTube channel, but that's like the facade of every, everything. And that's okay. And a lot of people say, say, oh my God, you're a famous YouTuber. I'm not. I'm just the guy, just like every one of you guys. I was in your shoes eight years ago. Um, and YouTube, I don't even think was even available or it wasn't that a thing then. Why do you want to be a YouTuber? I know you just got the mic stolen from me. <laughs> but 
I want to make sure that when you do it, you want to do it because you, you, it's not the easy way out. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a gym teacher because I wanted to play kickball every day of my life. <laughs> and then I realized that was the easy way out. And then I realized it wasn't until my senior year of high school uh, that I was in my TV production class that my teacher said, where are you going to film school? And I said, There's film school? No, I can't. No way. That's a thing. Like, I didn't know that this was a job. I want to make sure that when you, when you do it, because, and I'm not saying that this is what you're saying, but I want to make sure that it's not something, it's not the easy way out. Because if you want to make this a sustainable life and do that, it's not, it's not the easy way out. It's a hard way out. I kind of don't do it anymore because it's, it's so hard. And I also like traditional media uh, worlds better than just, uh, you know, putting a camera on myself and talking. Go to VidCon, go to Playlist Live, go to any, you know, um, I, obviously you're a fan of YouTube. I know you're wearing a Charles Trippy shirt, which is cool. He's a good friend. Um, but um, just be super passionate about it and learn and like, want to do it, but want to change something. Don't just say like, I want to like fall in line like everyone else. And we can talk more about this like outside if you want, but do it because you're passionate about it. And you know, all of you guys are passionate about what you're doing because you're at this school and you wouldn't just, this isn't just a school that you just go to because you're like, oh, I'm just going to go to this. Like you guys are passionate about something, whether it's recording arts or film or computer animation. And so if you're passionate about YouTube and really wanting to do that, don't call yourself a YouTuber and say, oh, I just want to put the camera on myself. Like, don't let that be just your dream goal. You know, maybe you want to be a host of something or maybe you want to be an actor, but, um, and it's okay to say, I want to be a professional. It's so weird to think that, like, if I was, in, you know, X amount of years ago when I was here to say, like, oh, I want to be a YouTuber, it just didn't make, didn't make sense. So hearing those words, it's just, it's kind of funny hearing it from, from, uh, from someone, but just be passionate, be creative, do something, be the change and do something that hasn't been done before. And if yeah. all else fails, videos of people getting hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Question from over here. Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm sorry, I don't really have a voice right now, but um, you kind of answered this already, but I'm just wondering, like probably a lot of people here, um, me and Sam, actually my friend, um, have a channel and I'm just wondering like how you can get people to actually like click on and watch your videos other than just like sharing them with your friends on like Facebook and Twitter and stuff. Like I know a lot of people put in like the comments of YouTubers that they're trying, that they really like or that their videos are similar to. They'll like say, check out my channel. I make videos similar to this. But a lot of people, like some people that really does work for them but I feel like it might be kind of like counterproductive that like other people think they're spamming and they don't want to click on it. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, which is right. Because whenever someone says, hey, I make cool videos, like check me out, people don't click that. What's stopping you? Uh, collaboration is huge. So I don't know if you three have a channel and you guys are all buddies or even if you guys want to like meet people from like who go to UCF down the street or something or someone in the area or even if they're across the country, there's nothing stopping you guys from, from, collab from collabing. That's a lot, how a lot of people started. Um, find people locally, do sketches and skits with them and just share their videos, have them share you. It shouldn't be a competition. You got, if you're collaborating with someone, it should be a group effort. So that's... One thing a lot of people overlook when they're starting doing YouTube or, and working with people, they're like, I'm just, the, all the views are mine, they're not yours. <laughs> At the end of it, have a call to action if you're collaborating with someone and say, hey, if you like this video, thanks for so-and-so for being in it with me. Go click their channel so that all their subscribers will see and all the viewers that you see. And I know starting off, it's hard. You have like, you know, you might have like 10 video views and be like, what the hell? I have a 500 Facebook friends. Why aren't people watching this? Um, but again, sometimes it, when you're just starting off, it's hard, but it's hard to find your voice. And it will take, sometimes it takes up to a year to do it, to find a style, to see what works. I'm sure if you watch your first video and you watch your last video, they're completely different. Keep working on it. Um, cream will always rise, I like to say. So collaborate, uh, be consistent, and have a unique voice. So, yeah. When, and I would say also it, it's a little bit like a snowball rolling down the hill, right? It, it takes it's, it goes slow at first, and then it starts to pick up speed as your audience gets bigger and they share more and more. 
It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. But you do have to stick at it for a while. My daughter was, um, a couple of months ago, attempting to become Vine famous, but she gave up after a couple of months, and you know, it doesn't work that quickly. Are they, do, do they still use reply videos? I mean, they used to do that back in the day. I don't think they do that. I mean, YouTube I... YouTube doesn't support it. They get rid of it. Okay, yeah, get rid that of makes it. sense, because I haven't seen those in a while. Hmm. It takes a while, though, to reiterate. It's like, don't... Like, and a lot of people say, like, well, look at this. Hannah Hart made a video, and it's got a, like, millions of views from the first day. It's like, yeah, but that's, like, a very rare instance. So, you know, it will take time, but don't, don't give up. Keep going. <laughs> Over here. Uh, hi, my name's Kevin Ogata. I'm in the film program. Um, recently, YouTube's content uh, ID system has created you know, like, created some problems for um, people who have used like pre-existing uh, content, such as remixes, reviews, commentaries. Not so much for people who do vlogs and more original content. Um, so, for people who just start out, like if they're already partnered with a larger group, then they usually get a little bit of leeway. But for someone who just starts up, um, they probably get their stuff flagged instantly and that you know, YouTube takes the money from that because the monetization just goes to them. Um, do you think that this might create like a dynamic shift in the content that comes on YouTube because people are, will be like, oh, I don't want to create like, remixes anymore because like, YouTube just gets the money from it and I won't be able to like, get money from that. So do you think it might create like, a shift in the type of content people will watch on YouTube? I don't think it's going to create a shift in what people uh, watch who creates it, there might be a shift there because people might say, like, oh, I can't make, make money here or something. But let me tell you a story. There's a guy named Steve Cardinal. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He makes that, he made the, the Wrecking Ball parody of this chat roulette where he gets on there and it's the best video. <laughs> He's so funny. He's done that. He's done Katie, uh, the Call Me Maybe. He did that with chat roulette where he dresses up in a bikini. It's a very hairy man, mind you, dressing up in a bikini. And he gets millions, 20 million views but he doesn't make a dollar off of him. That's okay, because he, his growth is, he's, he's passed a million subscribers, and he's only been doing this for um, maybe like three years. So don't let, sometimes, I've, I've done trailer remixes, where I've done trailers from Inception and mixed them with, um, what was that Bradley Cooper movie where he takes the pill? Limitless. Yeah, Limitless. I've done that. And I knew they were like, we're not, you know, I, I didn't even hit the monetization button because I knew they were going to do that. And I didn't want to like risk getting flagged. But I was like, sometimes I just want to create something that's cool. People watching and sharing that, that video I think got a, a good amount of views and it converted a lot of people to subscribe. So that to me, there's the value of it. It's not money in my pocket. It's people who are sub subscribing. So, don't look at it being like, oh, I can't do this because it's a, I'm going to get flagged or something or I can't make money off of it. Do it and look at it from a different perspective. Yes, with that video, you're not making money, but are you growing your audience? And that to me is sometimes worth more money, more, more value than physical cash. Someone up. Um, right hello, my name's Eloy. And um, I had a quick question more on the branding side. Um, there are a lot of companies, Maker Studios comes to mind, that like get you partnered with them, apart from partner with YouTube. What exactly is their role in the branding of the channel? What do they do and like how do they help a channel? A lot of, a lot of networks like that, like look at them if you know nothing about uh, YouTube uh, partners uh, or people like Maker Studio, look at them like record labels. They're there to kind of facilitate and kind of help you go into like the direction that you're trying to go into. Even though Maker Studios handles a lot of YouTubers, um, th the point of it is to create it like it's a family. So if you join Maker Studios, maybe you can do a collab with someone like Cass MG or Shay Carl or something like that. So um, all the business is kind of run through them and they have opportunities to kind of uh, do some brand optimization and other brand, uh, branded content things. And you have a better chance of doing that because coming from someone like Maker Studios, who's a giant in the YouTube game, brands will look at them and say, hey, this is what we have. We have product A. Who can we use out of your circle of, of creators that can push this brand or do some kind of viral video around it? So that's kind of the point of, uh, of, network, of YouTube networks, I'd say. What about the CPM that you were talking about earlier? Does it help that or influence that at all? Sometimes with other networks, yeah, they have uh, higher CPMs. Right. Um, so, that, so that's definitely like a good uh, reason to go with a network. But they do take a percentage. So it's like you have a higher CPM, but you might have a percentage. So sometimes it equals out, 
sometimes it doesn't. So, yeah. Back here? Yeah. Oh, God. No matter how many times I grab a microphone, my adrenaline skyrockets. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, my name is Chad. I'm a film <laughs> student here at Full Sail, and I have a gaming channel on YouTube. I like to refer to myself as a YouTube gamer. I don't know why. I just like to give myself a specific title. Anyway, um, whenever I upload videos, I always want to have a good uh, uh, communication with my audience, even though as limited as it is, because I only have like 40 subscribers and only like maybe less than five people actually watch my videos. But um, I've always been torn between live commentary and post commentary. Like when I'm playing the game, I usually like to do the commentary as I do it so that it's more reactive, so, so, it, so it kind of fits what I'm doing. But uh, I've also realized that there are some videos like, there's a YouTuber I watched called um, uh, Frakey in 1080p on PC because he does post commentary where everything seems more like a fluided kind of structured like episode, like he's like like it's actually more entertaining. So I'm always torn between it. So do you guys have any um, advice on which is better or the positives and negatives for both? It, it, it I mean, chime in if you guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Video games. Uh, they answer to most internet marketing questions. Are it depends. <laughs> it depends on, on on what you want to do. I agree that the reactive thing is is probably a little bit more realistic. But sometimes people just want to hear people talk and maybe have a visual. Um, I know C Nanners, who's got like 2.5 million subscribers. He does the post thing where he 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 plays and then he'll jump in. And sometimes he won't even be looking at. As far as I know, he won't even be looking. When we did it, when I shot him in the film. He wasn't even looking at the screen, he was just talking. Um, and I think that's what a few people do. Um, gaming is huge on YouTube right now, and it has been for a while, but I think it, you know, it's up to you, whatever works. You could always, I would say, do the, the option A, which is to do the reactive one, and then if, it, if you see holes in it or whatever, just go in and just edit it and just <laughs> manipulate it and just you know, fill in the blanks. But when you're doing gaming commentary, just like when you're doing a vlog or anything, always be talking, always be saying something, don't let there be like dead air. So, yeah, mm -hmm. got it. I would also just try it both ways and see what works best. There's no reason you can't. Mm. Over here. Hi guys, uh, my name is Zach and I'm uh, a student in the uh, Film Masters program. Uh, I had a question about uh, scripted YouTube content. What role do you think um, content such as web series and webisodes play in the future of uh, the shifting media? Well, one of the things that we were going to talk about, Rob, was YouTube disbanding their funding for YouTube. And I don't know, Dan, if you want to speak to this, but YouTube, Google spent a ton of money coming up with their own, I think it was like 100 channels that were going to produce high quality content and everything. And that idea fizzled out and that I'm assuming is 100% because they didn't make enough money from it. Um, I, I think that YouTube uh, was started by you, the, the, the user-created content, and trying to force professionally produced content and, and, and things that are more forced and scripted and everything onto there doesn't necessarily fit with the way that YouTube has organically grown and become the second largest search engine in the world. I don't know if you have a comment on that, Dan. No, I think you nailed it. But I think that, like, you know, as far as, like, are you asking if, like, long-form content and narrative content and if that's going to happen or if it's just going to, like, eventually just be gaming channels and vlogs? Maybe not, uh, maybe not long-form, but, uh, you know, if you have a series of shorts, uh -huh. if you want to if you want to take, uh, uh, you know, maybe five to ten-minute uh, short films and turn them into webisodes mm -hmm. uh, or turn it into a web series, mm -hmm. is there any opportunity for growth doing that? Or, I mean, have you, or is YouTube maybe not the right... Uh, the right venue to, to to get that content out there. No, I think it's absolutely the right the right place to do that. I think people should be doing that as filmmakers and stuff. You guys should be testing the waters and seeing, kind of doing like episodic stuff, and testing it out on YouTube and seeing what the reaction is and seeing if people like it and uh, and have that thick skin to kind of look into the comments and see if people are tearing apart your work. Like that's good. You should guys you guys should develop that thick skin. Hopefully it's already there. But uh, let people tear apart your work. Let them welcome it. Um, I think putting it up on YouTube. I mean, where else are you going to put it? Just show. I mean, it, you could put it on Vimeo, but I think you're going to be a lot more successful if you put it up on YouTube and stuff. Um, people like that. People. I've seen. There's a webisode years back called uh, 
uh, I think like we need girlfriends or something, and it was, <laughs> it was, it was hilarious. I'm pretty sure it was we, we need girlfriends, and it was really they shot with like a DVX, and you know they shot with like an onboard mic, and it wasn't the best looking show, but the content was so good. And then those guys got picked up and did, they're doing something. I think one of them is now acts, a, a, does cameo roles on 30 Rock and stuff. And this was... Hey, D, he, the, uh, yeah, he, what's his name? I don't know his name. <laughs> <laughs> I, but he, yeah, we know... He that, also yeah. did the escalating interview. Uh, yeah. Where they, yeah, that was... Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, so yeah, I would, I, would continue, I would continue doing that. And like, don't be afraid. I know it sucks sometimes to like... You, it's like you have that nervous... You're like, oh, should I upload this? Should I not upload this? Like, you guys are... Students and you guys are here, so it's it's a time to learn. So put it up, and you know, again, I can't stress enough that if you're, it's not perfect and people tear it apart, seriously, like look into that criticism. If it's constructive, take it. If it's just like, if it's some twelve-year-old ranting and trolling, don't worry about it. But yeah, another thing too. I mean, and this is just how I see it. I got rid of cable, so I don't actually watch regular programming. So I, I strictly watch YouTube. But I have Apple TV in the living room. So I keep saying, man, if, they, if somebody's going to do this right and really make something awesome where you'd look forward to get home to watch something that was something that you'd look forward to get home to watch, like it's some shorts or something like that, you know, actually just sitting there and just kind of you know, watching it on your big screen TV like it was a regular TV show, I think it's genius. I'd say go for it. And then remember me when you make it big. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jessica Northey, and I'm in the um, New Media Journalism master's degree. And my question is, is about, uh, I just recently started working as a web content producer for a sports radio station, and I've been creating some videos that are more about the community and the sports, but they're not, they, the owners want it to go back to the radio station, so my question is, should I focus more on the personalities at the radio station or the community? I'm, because I'm, I'm, I don't have a boss. I'm the only one in the department. So uh -huh. I'm just thinking. Here's some experts that maybe can point me in the right direction. So about the community within the, I'm a little like sports. Like Pop Warner was here at ESPN, uh -huh. Wide World of Sports, and I just went out there, and it ended up looking like a little promo. Uh -huh. But there wasn't. There was like three views, you know. Uh -huh. And then I had a, another video where it's like I showed the fans and what they were doing. It was kind of popular. But then we have, a, we have the programmers, the personalities at the radio station. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about pitching to my boss that I should come in and do more videos of what they're doing in the studio mm -hmm. that's not on TV because it's radio. But I was just wondering, if, is that more interesting? Or is it more about... Because the, the goal is to get more audience to listen to the radio station. I, I mean, if, they, like, if they're interesting yeah. off, off of the mic... And they have like like almost like a reality kind of like almost TMZ show. Is that what you were kind of talking? Yeah, about? it was just an idea. But it. yeah, that's actually cool. If I mean, if they're interesting people and they they can open up, I mean, it sounds like more than just like you'd have to get a few different cam ops and stuff in there. And like it sounds like a whole production rather than just going out and filming quick interviews yeah. with people doing Pop Warner and stuff. But pitch it to them. I'd 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 look into that. That could be cool. Everyone likes to see behind the scene behind the scenes stuff. I personally can't stand TMZ, but it's like one of the biggest shows. <laughs> Right now, so pitch it to them and show them that, and like maybe just say, "Hey, you know, whenever I try to pitch someone on something, if they're like on the fence, I always say, "Let me do one for you, and we'll see what happens." So pitch it to them and then say, "Let me uh, let's let's do one." Well, also too, who's your audience? Like the guys that are listening to the radio station, do they know? I mean, who's your demographic? So it's not the people at the Pop Warner. I mean, like if it's the parents of the Pop Warner kids, I mean, that might be something. Then I would. If I had kids in Pop Warner, I'd want to know what was going on in this local area. Makes sense. Hey, you're on YouTube. You know, like, you know, something like that's kind of cool. I mean, I, I don't know. Find out who their audience is, too. I mean, I think that would be most important, I think. And if they're, whoever, whatever they pay attention to, if you're able to find out, like, who's the current people that are watching their show, and then go look them up and see who else they like and what kind of content they produce, you might just be able to borrow some nice ideas.